One of my least favorite seasons in life is election season. When I became a pastor, I never realized how challenging it would be to be because what brings us together in this place is our love of Jesus. But we may not be on the same page politically. A lot of churches are very diverse in their politics. People sometimes have really different priorities on how to make those decisions. And that can make church life really awkward. Now, I've told this story a a number of times before, but I don't think I've shared it here yet. And so a a couple years ago, on January 10th, 2021, the Sunday after the January 6th insurrection thing, something happened in the church that I was pastoring at that time. Um, Now, if you don't remember the atmosphere around January 6th, let me take you back. It was a mess. When those people stormed the Capitol, right, and the senators and Congress people, they had to like go into hiding, and there were some police officers who got killed, and it was a horrible day. And as it was unfolding on the news live, like for me that Wednesday, I was glued to my television set. I couldn't believe what I was watching. Um, And after that, there was this shock. And it was kind of scary because a lot of us felt like that nothing like that would ever happen in our democratic process. And if you remember, this was on the end of a really ugly election season. We had these like super old candidates that were really unpopular with their opponents and just very generally, people were being so mean to each other. Boy, it's a really good thing we're not in that exact same situation this year. Now, at the time, the church I was serving, in that church, there were Trump supporters who would come to me and they were telling me, my whole family treats me like I'm a monster because I, they get so mad that I support Trump. And in that same church, there were Biden supporters and they would come to me and they would tell me about how Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner was like a half-empty table because there were family members who wouldn't sit together. And that was on top of all the COVID-19 drama. You guys remember that? 2020 was a rough year. And so January 6th was a Wednesday. And on the day, in the days that followed, there was this moment. It was just a quick moment where there was like silence, this shock. And then we all took a deep breath, and then we just started screaming at one another. Right? That's what we did. We were just, accusations were just flying back and forth, and it was really ugly. Practically felt like we were back in the election season all over again. And that was the environment when January 10th happened the Sunday after January 6th. Now, the congregation that I was serving at the time was actually pretty diverse in politics, right? Um, In that church, there were staunch, ardent Republicans, right? The ones who had like the tattoo with a little heart of Trump's name, right? They were just big time Trump supporters. But in the same congregation, like three seats over, there were staunch, ardent Democrats. And then there was a big chunk in the middle who didn't really want to talk about it, right? They're just, I don't really like either. In that church, there was a variety of political beliefs. And so as a pastor, I get to do kind of this nice little tightrope walk because I love both people. I serve as a pastor to both types of people. And so January 10th came, and I'm just going to be honest with you guys, I was nervous. I didn't know what the fallout was going to be. I didn't know what it was going to look like. And to be honest, I was still processing that stuff myself. And so I arrive in the morning, and I'm doing all my normal stuff. If you guys know me, you know, I'm just always running around from thing to thing. I don't really sit still well. And so... It was just a few minutes before worship, and I was leaving my office, and I was headed over to the soundboard. I had to go grab something from the soundboard. I don't remember what it was. I think I needed to, like, push a button or maybe get some batteries or something. I needed to go to the soundboard. And I see across the way, this was a church that had a large foyer area, and I see between me and the soundboard, there are two very elderly gentlemen who were speaking very intensely to one another. Now, I know these guys. They were both in their mid-80s, and one of them was a big Trump reporter, Trump supporter, big-time Republican. And the other one was a staunch Democrat who was convinced that Trump was like the worst thing that ever happened to our country. And both of them loved to post about it on Facebook. It was a lot of fun being both their friends on Facebook. And so I see them across the way speaking really intensely to another, to one another. And I literally had a moment where I thought, oh man, am I going to have to break up an old man fight before church? Like, is that what being a pastor in 2021 means? <laughs> So I start walking towards them, and I hesitate. I'm like dragging my feet. I don't want to deal with this, right? And I'm, I start to get closer to them, and I can overhear what they're saying. 
And I hear one of them say to the other one, he says, you know, I've got a doctor's appointment on Tuesday morning, and I'm really nervous about it. To be honest, I'm kind of scared. And the other guy puts his arm around his friend, and he says, well, hey, you, I'm going to be praying for you, and I want you to give me a call afterwards and let me know how it goes. And I hear that, and I just breeze right on past him. <laughs> I didn't say anything. And we gathered that morning, and we worshiped Jesus that day. And I love to tell that story because it can be such a mess out there when it comes to all this election stuff. But in the middle of all that mess, the church has an opportunity to be something different. In this place, we have a chance to put aside our differences, to focus on the one thing that unites us, our love of Jesus Christ. Today, we are finishing up our series from Matthew 5. We've been walking all summer through this passage called the Beatitudes, and Jesus has been taking our backwards hearts and flipping us right side up almost every single week. And so today, we're going to jump into verse 9. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. And another translation says, blessed are the peacemakers. Now, you've probably heard those words before. It's a pretty famous passage, but I need to pause for half a second before we dive in. I just really need to make sure you know how important this message is. I mean, I just told you a story from four years ago, January 2021, but in politics, the world has not calmed down. Someone shot one of the presidential candidates two weeks ago. People died. Innocent people died. And it doesn't even have to be that dramatic. Like, I know that's the big dramatic headline right now, but in smaller ways, in every single one of our lives, we are living smaller versions of our own personal chaos, and we are desperate for peace. Jesus' call to be a peacemaker might be the most important call that our world needs to hear today. But to really get at this idea of what it means to be a peacemaker, we need to dive into the book of Ephesians. So if you want to grab your Bible or bring it up on your phone, we are going to be walking through the whole of chapter 4 of Ephesians. This is so good. Now, Ephesians is where this guy Paul, he went, uh, he's writing to a church in the town of Ephesus. If you're not familiar, a lot of the books in the New Testament are written to churches that were struggling with a particular issue. And apparently in that town, they had a lot to learn about how to love each other and how to be makers of peace. So he wrote them this letter to encourage them and to challenge them. And it's one of those things where I am so grateful for their struggles because it means that we can learn from what they dealt with. Paul's guidance for them maps on almost perfectly to our modern moment. So what you're going to see is incredibly practical advice for us in the modern world. It starts like this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore I, a prisoner uh, for serving the Lord... Bleh, 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 bleh. <laughs> Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with one another, making allowance for each other's faults because of our love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. See, this is the first major teaching I want you to grab onto this morning. The church is the perfect place to practice peacemaking. Say that five times fast. It's one of these things where we are thrown together in this place with people who are completely different than us. Um, I saw this uh, post on a social media app called Threads this past week, uh, which it's kind of like Twitter, but it's a little newer. And there was this fellow who had a Christian page on Threads, and he was posting, and this is what he said. He said, all I'm seeing are Christians on here. Let's take over. And I almost felt bad for him <laughs> because it was like, oh, sorry, but that's not how this works at all, right? Social media, is, the algorithm is designed to show you what it thinks you want to see. He said, I'm a Christian account, so that's all they were showing him was other Christians' accounts. Social media is one of the best examples of this in the whole modern world. They are specifically designed to give you a timeline that shows you stuff we will engage with. And for all of us, this creates a little bubble where all the people who think and talk like us hang out in the same place. And inside that bubble, you're never challenged. You never have to be confronted with someone who is different. And if you are, you can dismiss them. You can unfollow them, block them, get rid of them. I mean, how many of us have unfollowed someone in the last five years? 
Like if you're on social media, how many of you have, you're just, you see someone, maybe they're an old friend you've known for years and you just think, oh my gosh, I can't handle their posts anymore, right? A lot of people have kind of gone off the rails in one direction or the other and I just don't want to follow them anymore. So we just unsubscribe. I don't want to deal with it anymore. I know I've done this. I've got friends who, maybe it was during COVID or maybe it was during the Israel-Gaza thing or during the election, their posts get really aggressive and they are sharing perspectives that I don't agree with and I don't want to deal with it. So rather than talking to them, I just disengage. Rather than having a conversation where I might learn something from them or they might learn something from me, rather than that, rather than growing together as people, I just walk away. I've done this a whole bunch of times. It's very convicting for me. Rather than have a conversation, I walk away. The modern world has this preoccupation, this core belief that you shouldn't have to deal with something that might make you grow. Let me say it again. The modern world believes you shouldn't have to deal with something that might make you grow. But Paul in Ephesians, he's pushing back against that. He says, no, 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 no. In our differences, in our moments of disagreement, that is where we have an opportunity to be people who make peace. Listen to this again. Verse two, Ephesians chapter four, verse two. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of our love. I love that line because I think it is so hard to do. Make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Now, I want to be careful with this. Okay, Paul is not encouraging us to allow sin, right? To embrace it or or to affirm it. None of that. I think people kind of get stuck on that. Some people think that to, to love means to give permission. It means allow it. They think it means being a doormat. Well, I love them, so I got to let them do whatever they want. And that's one side of it. And actually, the other side has problems too. Some people think that love is to say the hard thing, to be harsh and mean, to speak strongly against sin and then ignore it in each other. And what happens in a lot of churches, they take a hard line on sin and then they spend the rest of their community life pretending that none of them struggle. I grew up in churches like this. Pastors will, will teach on something and then everyone will pretend that nobody deals with that. No, 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 that's not one of that. We don't do that stuff. Right? Pastors will preach on pornography, and then the men will all study their toes during the fellowship time. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. I don't even like pictures. I don't know. Or we'll hear a teaching on gossip, or lying, or adultery, or greed, or whatever it is, and then we pretend that we don't have three friends who are going through that same thing. But Paul says, make allowance for each other's faults. In the Greek, that word is anek- anechemenoi. I don't know how to say it, but it's another translation for to bear with someone. And it gives us this imagery of someone who is trying to lift something heavy. Like maybe they've got a log or something and they're trying to lift it and you get under the log with them. You bear that weight alongside them to help them lift it, help them to overcome their burden. It's, that's, that is not a mentality you're going to get in a lot of places. Most of the world encourages you. They say, look, if you're dis- uh, going to disagree, if you're going to have any kind of friction, just walk away. But with the church, even when you see problems in someone else's life, we're not called to walk away. Making an allowance for someone's fault doesn't mean we allow their sins. It means we allow them to be broken people and we're going to deal with the sin together. We are called to get in there with them, bear their burdens alongside them. With the church, God has given us a gift a collection of people who are different than us, who we can love and fail to love and reconcile with and love all over again. The church is the perfect place to practice peacemaking. It keeps going in verse four, and it says, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. I know that was a lot of ones, but basically the point is very simple. God is the thing that brings us together in this place. He is over us. He's in us, living through us. Even our silly little stumbling and fumbling efforts at community is a holy thing. I know sometimes we get caught up in the cool lights or the awesome sound systems or how trendy everything can be, but the reality is that this is a sacred space. The way we treat each other and love one another in this place is a holy thing. 
And then Paul starts talking about leaders in the church, pastors and whatnot. And jump down with me into verse 12. Chapter 4, verse 12. He talks about pastors and leaders in the church. And it says, Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and our knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So this, this thing that we do in community where we're learning from each other and we're trying and failing and trying again and then succeeding, challenging each other, encouraging them, this is God's method for helping us to grow, living in community with one another. Keep reading with me, verse 14. It says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever it sounds like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. (laughs) Sometimes I read the Bible and I can't help but think, like, what am I even doing up here? Like, forget preaching. I'm just going to get a stool, and I'm going to sit here and read God's word to you, and then pause and say, isn't that awesome? And then I'll just read some more. Like, you don't need me to comment on that. That's gorgeous. It's amazing. It's so good. As we live and interact as the church, we grow in our maturity. As the gospel works into our life, we will be rooted in our love of Jesus, and that's going to unite us, give us a strong foundation to build our life. If you want to be a peacemaker, you need those roots. That's what keeps us from being knocked about, thrown about by every trendy teaching. And actually, this is a theme that you find all over the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter 4, but let me show you something. Chapter 2, verse 14. I'm going to put it on the screen so you don't have to worry about looking it up. For Christ himself has brought us peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when with his own body on the cross, he broke down the walls of hostility that separate us. He broke down the walls. And then over in chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust in him, and your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. So first, Paul teaches us that the church is the perfect place to practice peacemaking. Then he shows us to be a peacemaker means you've got to be rooted in the gospel. You've got to be rooted in your love of Jesus. It unites us and it helps us to grow. Let me put it another way. When I was in high school, there was this huge Christian rock festival. It was called Ichthus. It was down in Wilmore, Kentucky. It's like 30,000 people gathered for like a whole week of concerts. And you go camping, you bring your tents, and you've got like your, your little canvas tents or whatever. And then you can go to the festival and listen to music and speakers, and then you come back. It was so much fun. And one year, we got rained out. I think I was in ninth grade when I went. And the one year we got rained out, we'd been through two or three days of festival already. And it was the last day. It was Saturday afternoon and they canceled the final shows. They, the storms were coming. They got on the stage and they said, okay, everybody go home. Everybody go back to your tents and uh, pack up and go home. Now in my group, we had like 20 or 30 of us that went to this event and we, we kind of looked at each other and said, we'll be all right. I don't mind getting a little wet. We're tough. We're from Michigan. So we battened down the hatches. We added a couple of extra bungee cords to the tarps and we moved on. We were sitting there playing cards, and the storm was pretty intense, but we were nice and sheltered in our little area, and so it's Saturday night. We're up playing euchre. I remember this so clearly. We were sitting there at the card table playing euchre. It's maybe 10 p.m. A storm is raging outside. When the festival staff starts coming around, and they say, nope, it's no longer optional. You have to leave. It's not a storm. It's a tornado, and the tornado is a couple miles over there. It's coming towards us. You have to get out now. Problem was, we didn't pack up when it was just starting to rain. So we got to pack up while it was pouring on us. We were camped next to this ditch, and it was full of mud and rain. It was like two feet of mud, and the cars got stuck. And so you got a bunch of teenagers out in the mud just pushing and pulling these trucks and these vans, trying to get them out of the mud. And we didn't have a chance to pack up stuff, so we're just packing it up in the mud and throwing it into the trailer. It's all disgusting. It was so messy, um, and everything was soaked, including all of us campers. I had this like brand new camp shirt, not camp, the, you know, the festival shirt. And 
I was so proud of it. And I'm pushing and I got right behind the tire, you know, and the mud just sprayed up and I'm caked in mud. And the best we could do, I mean, it's like 2 a.m. by the time we're finally packed up and we got out of the field. And so all we could do was we drove up the road a few minutes. You know, we were far enough away from the tornado. We parked in a gas station, like just in the lot. And they said, just sleep in your chairs. Like just sleep in the cars. That's all we could do. It was awful. But something happened. The strangest thing happened. After this messy, horrible chaos of an event, as time went on, there was this unity that developed amongst those who went. We were the elite festival goers. You know what I'm talking about? Like, we would talk to the other kids. It was like, were you there that year? Yeah, I was there. I was in the mud. I was there that year. The struggle, the mess, the mud bound us together. And 20 years later, I'm still, I will reminisce with my friends about that trip. See, what I'm trying to say is that peacemaking is hard, but it brings an incredible unity in your life. In your life, when you walk with, through a struggle with someone, your relationship has an opportunity to grow. It's no fun when you're in the middle of it, of course. But as time goes on, you will grow closer to the people who were there with you in those moments. Maybe you can't remember the awesome worship songs we sang last week but you remember who visited you when you were in the hospital. Maybe you can't remember your incredible work stats or your increased productivity at your job, but you remember who brought you dinner when you were downsized. You remember who was there when you needed to talk, who was there when gave you a shoulder to cry on or an ear to scream into or a helping hand to pick you up when you fell. Being rooted in the gospel, in the love of Jesus. It's not about a great sermon or really cool kids ministry. It is that moment when we hunch down under the heavy log that is squishing our friend and we bear their burden and we walk with them and we help them to overcome. That love, that service, it creates an incredible unity, a bond that is stronger than what you get if you only hang out with people when everything is good and the sun is shining. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Jesus says, God blesses those who work for peace. And our world desperately needs more peacemakers. If you're starting to pick it up, this is a really hard work. My heart, to be honest, my heart is not naturally drawn to peace. I don't want to be a peacemaker. I want to win a fight. I want to hold a grudge. I want to beat my enemies and run away from people who are different than me. That's what my heart wants, if I'm honest. That's what I want. But through Paul, Jesus is calling us to something better. Back in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 picks it up, and it says, But this isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and you have learned the truth that comes from him, throw away your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. But instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. You might remember last week, we talked about being pure in heart. And we realized the truth is our hearts are not automatically pure. You can't scrub your heart clean. We have to get a heart transplant from God. It's the same thing with peacemaking. In our natural state, our heart doesn't work for peace. But what Paul is showing us is that the Holy Spirit helps us to be peacemakers by giving us a peacemaking spirit with God working on our heart, with the Holy Spirit doing a good work in us, we put on a new nature, and then we are ready to work for peace. The church is a perfect place to practice peacemaking. To be a peacemaker requires us to be rooted in the love of Jesus that unites us, brings us together. And number three, if we're going to do this peacemaking thing, we need help from the Holy Spirit. We've got to throw off the old nature, let God renew our thoughts, renew our minds. What I hope you're catching from all this is that peacemaking is not passive. It takes purpose and power. I think sometimes people mix up peacemaking with peacekeeping. I think some people think peace is the same thing as quiet. If I could just keep things quiet. Don't, don't rock the boat. Just gotta, I'm a peacekeeper. But peace is not the absence of disruption. Peace is not avoiding your problems. Because here's the thing. If all you have is quiet, if all you have is outside calm but not real peace, if you don't have peace out here, you can't have peace in here. You might have temporary quiet out here, but that's not going to do anything for you in here in your heart because peace is not the same thing as quiet. The good news I have for you this morning is that God makes peacemakers into a world of turmoil and hatred and constant chaos and fighting. Our God brings true and everlasting peace. So let me ask you, what is it in your life that is stealing your peace? 
Where could you take the false quiet that's around you and turn it into actual peace? Is it politics? Is, it, is your Thanksgiving table as divided as mine is? I talk to so many people, and they say, well, my family is so crazy. And I think they all seem to be convinced that they are the only one with a weirdo family. I think the secret is we all have families like that. Like, it's just a, it's a universal thing. We all, I'm pretty sure it's a prerequisite. All families everywhere have a little bit of mess, a little bit of crazy. So where can you be a peacemaker? Have you built yourself an echo chamber? Do you just live in this little bubble where everyone agrees with you racially, socioeconomically? Or is it your past, the labels you use on your life? What is stealing your peace? Byron Center is a rapidly changing town. It's growing like crazy, and there's new people all around us all the time. Are we walling ourselves off to give us a false sense of quiet? Or are we engaging with people who are different than us to create real peace in our lives? Our world desperately needs peacemakers. Are we going to step into that role or are we going to hide inside our bubbles? Now Paul finishes with the chapter with some super practical methods on how to be a peacemaker. So I'm just going to touch on two of them and then we're done. I want to leave you with this as a challenge. Number one, it comes from verse 26. Chapter 4, verse 26. It says, And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. (laughs) <laughs> okay, can I just be honest with you? When I was a little kid, I read this passage. I used to take it literally. Don't go to bed while you're still angry. I used to literally think, like, I'm not allowed to go to bed if I'm mad. I have to solve all that before I can go to bed. And I remember when I first got married, sometimes my wife Sarah would be looking to start a fight at, like, 8.30 p.m., and I'd be thinking to myself, babe, I'm not sure we have time for this, <laughs> right? Because I got I to gotta be all calmed down by 10 o'clock if I'm going to get my tight eight hours. <laughs> But it has nothing to do with sleeping. What that verse is about, it means don't let anger go unresolved. Have you ever had that where you fight and you disagree or whatever and you never really deal with it? You just sort of, you leave it alone and you move on without ever dealing with it. You never reconcile. You never say sorry. You never repent. You never heal. So it's just out there. Paul says peacemakers don't let anger linger. You are allowed to go to bed. But then when you wake up, deal with it. Close the loop on that anger. Do the work to make peace. Jesus actually says in Matthew 5, verse 23, he says, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person and then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Can you imagine? Jesus is saying, look, I want you to come and and do the sacrifice in the temple before God. But before you can do that, you've got to square things with your brother. If you remember that they have something against you, fix that. Then come and worship. So that's my first challenge for you. Don't let anger linger in your life. Find reconciliation. The second challenge, we go back into Ephesians, is verse 29, right at the end of the chapter. And it says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Now, this verse is a bit of a pet peeve of mine because Christians (laughs) are well known as the people who do not use the forbidden alphabet. You know what I'm talking about? the A word, the B word, the C word, the D, right? Where the words we're not allowed to say, right? Somewhere back in like the 1960s, we made it a top moral priority to make sure that none of us, none of us would ever be potty mouths. It's the most important thing about being a Christian. But that's not actually what's in the Bible, right? The Bible doesn't have this list where it says, don't use these words, and then it just lists them all. That's not what it says. What it actually says is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything we say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear me, hear them. Do you see how that's actually way better and way more important? You might never use a curse word in your life, gosh darn it, but you can still use clean words to hurt people. But the peacemaker standard is not about which words you use, but whether the words are foul or abusive. Let your words be an encouragement So those are my two challenges for you to be peacemakers. Number one, don't let anger linger in your life. And number two, let your words be encouraging.
And the last two verses of the chapter sum it up beautifully. I love this. It says, chapter 4, verse 30, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, harsh uh, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Four years ago, I thought I was going to have to break up an old man fight between a Republican and a Democrat in my church. But they proved me wrong because the church is the perfect place to practice peacemaking. Ever since Trump got shot two weeks ago, there have been so many calls to lower the temperature of the congregation, uh, conversation, to disagree with compassion and understanding. And I'll be honest, I don't think they know how to do it, Right? The church has to lead the way on how to be a peacemaker. We need to be rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus with the help of the Holy Spirit. That is the only way to get it done. Paul gives us all this practical advice. He gives us all this wisdom on how to get it done, but it all starts with your will, with your commitment. Are you going to be a person who works for peace in this world? It's a hard road to walk. I'm not sugarcoating it at all today. But this is how we can be children of God and bless our city, bless our families, bless the people around us. Blessed are the peacemakers, but they will be children of God.